Welcome to the Catholic Sphere. Each week we have a different host and a different focus as we tackle topics important to Catholics around the globe. I'm your host this week, Debbie Cowden. Today we're discussing vocation discernment. I'm joined by three leading women in the Catholic world who will offer beautiful insight on the roles parents play in their kids' vocation discernment, as well as practical ways that parents can help their children listen to God's call. The first of these women is Sister John Dominic Rasmussen. She is one of the four foundresses of the Dominican Sisters of Mary, Mother of the Eucharist in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She has over 30 years of experience as a Catholic educator and administrator and is the mastermind behind the Disciple of Christ Education and Virtue Program, which aims to assist teachers and parents in cultivating virtue in the hearts of children. And she's joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Kendra Tierney is the founder of Catholic All Year and author of the Catholic All Year Compendium, Liturgical Living for Real Life. For over 20 years, she's been using food, prayer, and conversation around the liturgical calendar to make the Catholic faith come alive for families all over the world. She's the mother of 10 children, and she's joining us from Los Angeles, California. And finally, Kristalina Everett, host of Women Made New on EWTN Radio and co-founder of The Chastity Project. She's the author of several best-selling books, as well as a brand new book from EWTN Publishing, Women Made New, Reflections on Adversity, Transformation, and Healing. She's a mom of eight children on earth and three in heaven, and she joins us from Phoenix, Arizona. Sister John Dominic, I want to start with you because I think the story of how you discovered <laughs> your vocation is so inspiring. You are actually a convert to the faith, and as a high schooler, you made the decision to become Catholic. And in, in a podcast that you did a couple years ago with your fellow Dominican sister, Joseph Andrew, you two talked about how even though you didn't know much about the faith while going to a Catholic school, you had a deep desire to know God and know the truth. And that as a child long before your conversion, you prayed every day, I love this, dear God, show me how to love you more. Can you tell us how God answered that prayer through your childhood leading up to your vocation? Well, that's a that's a, a great question, and um, obviously, if you look how I'm I'm dressed now, that um, he did answer that prayer. So our prayers are answered. Um, I would say that uh, when I started praying that prayer, it really wasn't with the idea or even understanding what a Catholic, what a religious life was, and or even the idea of what vocation was. I really began praying that after a time of fear when I was attending a Christian school and they were talking about singing the song about the end of the world. And I became afraid that I was going to be left behind. And then something from that fear, something stirred within me, um, asking God, you know, show me how I can love you more. And God, you know, God moves through these situations. And I think the beautiful thing I'd have to say is that uh, recognizing his gentleness in my own um, personal life, my journey, that when I went from that Christian school and walking into a Catholic school for the very first time, um, never seen a Catholic nun before, and when the first time I saw the sisters, I was like, what are they and what are they wearing, you know? And um, through that journey and, and that prayer, just kind of like my heart being open, um, I, as I began to, um, in my religion class and a sister was teaching me, I would begin to um, argue and dispute things. And my father, who was a very good man and a very logical man, um, would always say, if something's true, it's true, you know? So the more I fought, the more I realized that what I was being taught was the truth. And then one day before uh, the Blessed Sacrament, um, I was like, I'm sitting here in Jesus's presence and I need to become a Catholic. And so I was. it was that journey, that moment of decision. So at that time, I didn't really think about that um, I was even going to live religious life. But what I think the important thing, if we go back to that very simple prayer, is that, you know, what what is prayer? Prayer is that, that conversation, that beginning, that relationship. So in my time of prayer, you know, asking God in that simple petition, um, he was he himself was nurturing that grace in my heart. And he's the one who brings that, you know, to grow through, um, into fruition. So um, 
it's you know there's a, there's a lot more to the journey but i think as we're talking about vocations it's that simple walking and building that relationship with god that i started without even really without even realizing it you know he's a god of surprises you know and he's leading me home to the household of god and this is the my path of, of how i'm how i'm being called to live you know amen and a god of gentleness that's so important for yeah. us to remember yeah. as we are helping our kids discern their vocation. Kendra, as we can see from Sister Story, God's gentle calling for us begins long before we even know what a vocation is. And you've made it your mission to bring the truth, beauty, and goodness of the Catholic faith into the home so that it can be lived and so that children can be in a place where they can hear God's call. Tell us more about how it's within the family, the domestic church, that those seeds of vocation are planted. Yeah, absolutely. I think there that you know, my focus with my family is is this idea of of observing the the feast days and the seasons of of the church year of the liturgical calendar in the home, and as we're doing that, we're encountering so many different saints and and you know learning their stories, learning uh, you know their their struggles, and and of course seeing that so many of them are uh, are priests and religious and. And so to have that familiarity with that as an option, which, you know, when I was growing up, I, I knew there was such a thing as nuns. And of course I saw priests on Sundays, but I remember being in college and the first time I saw the, the Carmelite sisters in Alhambra, I pulled up to, to a church up here and I saw them walk across a crosswalk. And I was just amazed because I'd never seen it. And there was just such a beauty there. And I want to make sure my kids don't have that experience of waiting until they are young adults to be able to consider that as a vocation. So, you know, we, we make sure that we talk about, uh, about priests and, and religious and, and we make sure that we get to know them also as, as, as friends. We have, we have our priests over for dinner. We, uh, we still see those Carmelite sisters in Alhambra um, and, and we go to their events and we make sure that, you know, that, that my kids know them as people and not just as ideas. Well, right, because Crystalina, statistically speaking, the most common vocation that our children will be called to is marriage. And that is the one that they probably see the most of. So what are some ways that parents can not only model a holy marriage, but then also introduce their children to the vocations of the priesthood, religious life, chaste single life, and develop that familiarity? I think the most important thing parents can do is let them know they were made for a mission, a purpose, and a plan. And every person walking on this planet, God has a specific plan for their life. And he has a plan for your life. And the, it's, it's built in us. We know it. Like there are people watching this right now that are miserable in their jobs, in the, some relationships, and things that they're doing because they're not supposed to be doing it. They're not supposed to be there, but they're not listening to that small, still voice, that guide that God does give us. And I try to put things in ABC terms for my children that they can get it because they're very literal, right? Especially when they're little and that, that your, your conscience and that small, still voice is almost the compass for heaven. So just listen. Every time God says something, no matter what, listen. If you're not doing something you're supposed to, you need to listen because God's trying to protect us. And, and it will avoid a lot of just drama in one's life. And so just be very basic with our children. I remember my two-year-old came up to me, no, three-year-old came up to me. He's like, mommy, why is God a light bulb? And I said, what? What do you mean a light bulb? And he goes, well, he's the light of the world. So why is he a light bulb? You know, and that's what we're dealing with. So just be very literal, very just ABCs with your kids. And even as they're older, so God's not intimidating, but that he's very loving, he's here, he's with us, and that prayer is a conversation, not just something that, oh, the big almighty God way up there that just looking down on us and judging us. No, it's a person. And we need to make our religion very accessible and easy for them that we don't overcomplicate it and just kind of one step at a time language. Amen. And what you said so beautifully and succinctly, listening to that still small voice. And then what, what Sister John Dominic said, God 
show me how to love you more. It's just incredible. We, we as adults tend to overcomplicate things, but it doesn't always have to be that way. And sister, over the past 25 years, your order in Ann Arbor has grown from just four sisters to over 150. Your mm -hmm. mother house is at full capacity and the average age of your sisters is only 32 years old. So what is it about the Dominican spirituality and the charism that is so attractive to the women that you're seeing entering in? And what are the common themes in these women's vocation stories? Yeah, that's, you know, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. And I think it, it pulls from actually what both, both of them have retouched on, you know, just the exposure. Um, we talk about with each of the, the religious communities that there's a particular charism. And for us with Dominicans, you know, it's truth, it's veritas. You know, we contemplate and we give to others the fruits of our contemplation. And I think in our age, you know, one thing that a lot of the women that are attracted to is that we do have, you know, Eucharistic adoration. This is where um, a lot of young people, when they have that exposure to that time of adoration, they're experiencing an interior peace that they're not finding anywhere else. And when they come and they come for a discernment retreat, um, we have all night adoration. Um, we make the consecration to Mary. Um, and uh, we, you know, each day we renew that as, as a community. So you kind of bring all of these together. And that's something that's um, appealing to the young women that are coming to be a part of education, to raise up you know, a generation of people that are, you know, understand you know, what adoration is, understand the beautiful devotion to Mary and this understanding of truth. And I think what, you know, we understand that when we expose them to the lives of the saints, you know, every, you know, all of us, we all have a purpose, you know, that we're all searching for something. And what we see in the lives of the saints is that all of the, every, you know, there's not a, like a, a blueprint of what it means to be a saint. It's following how God is leading them. And in religious life, there is that particular charism and, the, and, and we're not called to this life to be uh, miserable and sad. It's a, it's a call to be joyful and happy because that's how God created us, intended us to be. So understanding these charism, understanding these lives of the saints and recognizing that in your children, um, they, may have, they may be drawn to the poor, they may be drawn to study or intellectual life. Then you can kind of direct them um, to that charism, the more you understand that. So I think the beautiful work that both of these women are doing um, can help parents direct children if they come to them with that question and saying, I think my son or my daughter um, may have a vocation. Where do I start? You know. And then from there, sister, if I could ask you a follow-up question, what is the formation process like when you have the novitiate and the postulancy? What, how are you helping to develop the the attunement to the vocational call once uh, yeah. a young person or maybe even an older adult has, has discerned that maybe they might have a vocation to religious life? What does that look like for the Dominicans in particular? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I love how you word the word, use the word attunement because, you know, it's really like you really, we really have found that more and more we need to accompany the women even before they enter the community. Because oftentimes, like myself, you know, they may be the only person in the family that's Catholic or maybe even practicing their faith, and they experience a lot of resistance from their parents who may not understand the call. So they need someone to walk through them and help them understand that. So when they enter, there's a first year, which called is a pot, you know, they're a postulant, and that's a time when they're discerning if this is my call, and we also look at them and how they're living that vocation, um, because it's a very distinct call. There's lots of periods of time of silence and prayer and community living. And then, you know, following the church with, um, and many other religious communities do this as well, where we have the canonical year, where it's a year that's just focused on studying the vows, uh, uh, canon law, the catechism more deeply, understanding, you know, what you're going to be committing your life to. So that's even compared to like, you know, like an engagement, you know, like you have the dating period and they have the engagement time, you know, and then there's another time when you experience, uh, we have send them out to look at the apostolate. So we're in education. So they spend time in the schools. You're like, do I want to spend the rest of my life being a teacher, an educator? And so they, they get a taste of that. And then there's that time after three years when they make um, first vows. 
And then there's another longer period of time, a sermon period, which is five years up until find a profession. So the church is very wise uh, to give them to have this structure in place, all equal to like the seminary, um, because it is um, a state of life, you know, as John Paul II would re reiterate, is that, you know, it's the highest state of light, life because our focus is only on that, you know, relationship with God. And um, not that there's, you know, marriage is a vocation in and of itself, right? Um, so that's that's really, you know, that's it in a nutshell. I could elaborate more, but I think that kind of gives it to us, you know, in a nutshell. And we could have several shows that just cover what the process <laughs> is for becoming yeah. a religious sister, for, for entering consecrated yeah. religious life. I hope that maybe one day we can, because it's a, it's a great discussion to have so that people can learn more about what is involved, because for so many, they, they just don't know yet, and we hope yeah. to remedy yeah. that. Well, Kendra, we know that there are so many distractions out there in the world. Um, there's noise. Constant, uh, constantly being pounded with stimuli due to technology. It's all around us and all around our children as well. So what can we as parents do to cultivate an appreciation for and a desire for the stillness and silence that's needed to hear God's call, particularly as we've discussed in Eucharistic Adoration? How can we cultivate that appreciation? Yeah, I think that that is certainly very important to do as, as a parent in in our home i think that that the that something really important has been to cultivate a really strong catholic identity and and a family a strong family culture so my kids don't have the expectation that we're going to do things the way that other people do them we tyrannies just do things the tyranny way and that that sort of covers a lot of the questions that come up you know why can't we do this why can't we do that you know why do we uh, not eat meat on Fridays? Why do we observe Lent? Why can't I watch that movie? It's just because, you know, it, it's because that's how tyrannies do it. And uh, and so I, I think in the same way that, uh, that 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 kind of prepares them to live a countercultural life and and that and, and hopefully to really think, think seriously about about what their vocation is and about what what marriage and family life would look like, but also what what religious life would look like, and 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 to really think about if they are called to to the priesthood or religious life with with the strength that comes from, you know, I've been living my whole life differently than than other families, differently than you know than what I see on TV or in the movies, and um, and you know among friends at soccer. There, I think that there's there's a great power in that, in knowing that that you know we make our own choices and we're not beholden to the culture. What a beautiful perspective, and and like we had discussed earlier, the family is the place where our children are are receiving that first good news about their call from God. And Crystalina, though, we know that the devil hates the family. He hates the priesthood. He hates the church, and he will do anything that he can to get in the way of a soul responding to their vocational call. It's been widely reported that the devil himself once told St. John Vianney, if there were three such priests as you, my kingdom would be ruined. Tell us more about the spiritual battle that is raging and what parents can do to fight for their children and fight for current priests and religious. I feel like spiritual warfare is a topic most people are a little intimidated by and it's because of Hollywood and Exorcist movie and it's just a little overwhelming for people. But at the end of the day, we are in a spiritual battle if they wanna recognize it or not. And we need to teach our children at a very young age. We're kind of in this war or this battle and they need to be ready for it. And the most important thing I tell my kids is that you have on this earth is your soul and you need to take care of it. It's the most valuable thing that you have and it is precious and there's a battle over it. And I tell my kids straight out and very honest, I can't get you into heaven. I can help you get into schools. I can help you with all the different aspects of your life. And mommy is your biggest cheerleader. But when it comes to getting you into heaven at the end of the day, that is going to be up, up to you and on you. Now I can fast, I can pray, I can do everything as a mother, but at the end of the day, it's going to be them. And we need to teach them at a young age 
to one, like I said, listen to that small, still voice. It is a weapon, I feel. And we need to not be afraid to pick up the weapons that God has given us, the sacramentals, the sacraments in the church. Go to the commander in chief, the king, Jesus. We, I feel like as Catholics, we act like we're orphans that were left behind and he left in the clouds. No, I saw him today. Jesus is here. He's alive. He's well. He's in the Eucharist. And that is sometimes hard for people to grasp. But if you can teach your kids to be incredibly Eucharistic and to go to Jesus with all of their needs, with everything going on in their lives, when they walk out that door one day and you no longer have them with you on a day-to-day -day basis, you can know at least you planted that foundation that, look, you can go to any church anywhere, no matter what college, no matter where you're at in the world, and you can find Jesus in the Eucharist in a Catholic church. God willing, they're open and there isn't crazy going on in the society, but at the end of the day, Jesus is there and you have to just give your children back to him because that's who they will go to and rely on when you're not around. It's incredibly important, especially in spiritual warfare. Amen. I have goosebumps all over my body just thinking about your answer and listening to your answer, Kristalina. It is so important to, to fight for our children now and to pray, make sacrifices for them now, and to make sure that they know what options are out there when they're listening to God's call. Um, and sister, speaking of children, uh, this question is from my six-year-old daughter. We've been talking about vocations lately, and she's actually been very interested in the poor Claire's and the Carmelites because of Mother Angelica and St. Therese. So the question that she asked about marriage and religious life, which I'd like to relay to you is, she says, how will I know what God wants me to be? That's a, that's a beautiful question. And the fact that she's even asking that now, and, and I think the, you know, it's, it, it, the fact that she has drawn to the poor Claire's is showing that she's had that exposure. So I think that what you can, you know, how how does she know? I think it's if we talked about prayer earlier as that time of conversation, and that's really where mine came, is that, you know, dear God, show me how to love you more, um, allowing her to have the exposure of the other religious communities and seeing their charism and understanding that. But what at the end of the day, it's kind of like, you know, like I knew that I was going to marry your dad because we, there was this attraction. We loved one another. And I think that's the beautiful thing that we can show them in marriage because our vocation, it's spousal. You know, it's, it's I'm, I'm a bride of Christ. So it's where, I remember one time, um, one of the, uh, the moms of one of our sisters expressed, you know, she goes, I know that my daughter um, had a vocation because her heart was so big that it, only Jesus is the one that could have captured it and felt that. And I think that's really ultimately what it is, is that it's just that um, undivided heart that I'm called to have. And um, and it's a unique call um, as far as like the, the vocation. So keep encouraging her, tell her she's gonna know in the silence of her heart and she'll know when she receives Jesus in communion, when she's in adoration and just the joy, how she may feel when she's around uh, different religious um, as she experienced that, but that exposure to the other, all the other communities that are out there is really important for her uh, and, and discerning or any child, anyone. Thank you for that beautiful response. I'll be sure to pass it along to her. And uh, as we're winding down the show in the last few minutes, I'd like to really quickly nail down some practical steps that parents can take right now to aid their children in the discernment process. So again, we only have a couple minutes left. I wish we could talk more. Um, Sister John Dominic, for older children like our teens and our adult children, what are one or two practical steps for active discernment, like weekend retreats, uh, discernment, discernment visits to help them hear that call? Exactly, I would find a religious community or somebody that's nearby, go to Vespers, Mass, find some way that you can interact with them so that they can see them, understand their life. And um, another thing too is, is also in your di if it's in your diocese or the local church, or there's a community to encourage them to pray for them and have those visits and write to them, but also attending discernment retreats. A lot of communities um, offer those. And if they are, they're called to one or they feel attracted to one, support them in going to attend that and have that time so they can have that interaction with whatever religious community they may be called to. Yeah. Take the leap. Amen. Kendra, what are one or two practical ways that you can introduce children to priests and religious and help them develop a familiarity with religious life? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, in, invite invite your priest over to dinner, get to know him as a person and, and ask him to tell your kids, you know, ask him to tell the story of his vocation. Uh, and then I think the other really important thing is to, is to model reverence to, to the Eucharist, to attend a, a reverent mass, because if our kids don't see from our actions that we believe what we say we believe, then, then why would they, you know, make this leap? Why would they dedicate their lives to, to, you know, to, to serving Christ in his church? It, they have to, they have to believe, they have to see that we believe, they have to see that, that the priests that they encounter, um, actually believe. And so I, I think that, you know, two pieces that, that, uh, community and hospitality aspect, and then just really showing reverence to what we believe. Perfect. And Kristalina, one or two specific ways to pray for your child's vocation and then to help your child pray for their vocation too. I think parents need to go back to fasting for their children and the different onslaughts and attacks right now. And it's not what our parents dealt with. We're dealing with something completely different. And to also let your children know that it's going to be hard because our world constantly is telling them everything should be easy. It shouldn't be this hard for you. But you know what? When you have faith and you pray and you want to get close to Jesus, the evil one's going to come and try to counter that in some way, shape, or form. That this is it's not going to necessarily be easy, but God will give them the grace and to teach them to ask that question, God, what do you want me to be? If you can just give them that prayer to say, on a daily basis, they will learn to get the, that spiritual ear, to listen again to that small, still voice, to be their guide in the darkness of this world, because they can always go back to that. And no matter the confusion coming at them, they will know the direction that God is calling them to. And that's the only direction we want them going in. And I think if you can just fast for your kids and you can teach them that one vital question to take into prayer, that is going to be tremendous in their spiritual life. Amen. Listening to that still quiet voice and praying, God, what do you want me to do? And God, how can I love you more? Uh, ladies, this is such an important topic and I am so grateful for your insight today. And I just know that with the wisdom that you shared and the practical steps, you are really helping families to nurture those seeds of faith for our future vocations, for future priests and religious, future chaste singles, and also future married couples. So thank you truly from the bottom of my heart for joining me today. And thank you for joining me too. I hope that we get to see you next week on Catholic Sphere. <laughs>